so welcome all of you and uh, we thank you for sparing your you know precious time on a sunday morning uh, but uh, pooja and myself we figured this is one of the best times that you know we all have nothing else to do at least and everybody can spare some time to attend this webinar uh, today's topic is behavior and sensory concerns in special needs children basically when we say special needs children we all all children with all kinds of diagnosis children with all kinds of conditions presentations um i would focus on younger children that is up to age 7 just for today's topic because again 7 is not like a barrier i would say 6 7 because there are different concerns and different uh issues as a child gets older and then it you know enters a pre teen years so and i'm i'm most experienced you know in this age group although i know what to do with older children but i generally not uh, you know prefer to work with them for personal reasons um pooja here is an an icu therapist and there is lot to learn from her so if anybody is dealing with and i see you early intervention that is particularly first year of life generally early intervention by definition we say 0 to 3 years of life but if you are in the first year you may want to reach out to pooja for any questions as we go along um uh, you know you can type your questions in the chat box and we will try our best to answer them and today uh, we don't have any powerpoint or any presentation but both of us are just going to talk informally uh, as and when the uh, you know the topics concern so i will start pooja will also jump in uh, but any of you have questions please type them in the chat box i already have a question somebody sent to me uh, as soon as this webinar was announced so i will answer that first and then go on to the next questions in the order with which they come so let's start today is sensory and behavior concerns amongst children whom we see whom physiotherapists see so i'm assuming that uh, all of you are pediatric therapists here and that is great because and i would say stay in this field because you will get lot of silent blessings <laughs> and lot of loud blessings from children and families and also if you keep on constantly updating reading 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 applying reading applying understanding brainstorming attending any webinar some of the short courses i would not say certification courses but some of the short courses then uh, you know you will become a skilled therapist and then you will never be short of work so you know please keep that in mind um when we talk about sensory and behavior concerns um, you know these were new words new words to physiotherapists let's say um, even when i went to us more than 30 years ago sensory was sort of a new word to me and uh, it is a new word uh, for therapists in india during the last decade because uh, physiotherapists are just trying to understand what is sensory and you have to keep in mind that when we do motor so generally it is said that physiotherapists are experts in motor you know motor the so called muscles and uh motor development motor learning etc ot's are uh, experts in sensory now both are not very true for different reasons which i'm not going to discuss here but you have to bear in mind if you work with a child or for no matter a neuro patient an adult stroke patient that motor cannot be without sensory and sensory cannot be, be without motor you have to bear that in mind so when you are thinking about motor or muscle strength for example immediately proprioception should come to your mind and and you know we are taught about proprioceptors okay physiotherapists are taught about proprioceptors remember the uh, the balance tests that we do that is related to the proprioceptors but that is only a minute thing we are taught uh, sensory systems now the in the world uh, even i learned them as seven sensory systems you know a decade and a half ago but actually there are eight sensory systems at least that's what science says now and you should be at least somewhat aware of all this now when we talk about behaviors so again sensory and behavior cannot be two separate compartments 
they say every behavior is a communication meaning anything you are trying to do the anything the child is demonstrating in the form of behavior the child is trying to communicate that's what they say so again communication is a big part you know we are not speech therapists you cannot say that oh we are not speech therapists we don't know this but you at least have to be a little knowledgeable about what speech therapists do what is expressive communication what is receptive communication you have to observe whether the child is understanding you know even if the child is non verbal uh, or age appropriate speech is not there how much is the child understanding you have to be aware of that so now behavior and sensory there is a thin line to cross they are not two separate compartments um and and that is what um, uh, you know my message for this webinar is that when you see a child you know you cannot say oh that's all behavior let's send them to an aba therapist or this is all sensory let's them let's send them to an ot or a sensory expert there is something much in between and beyond all this and that is what you need to understand so pooja first you want to jump in before i move ahead in anything and what i said please add something if you can um yeah i was just going to say that you know as uh, as therapist i don't even want to say physios or pts pts right yeah. as therapist working with children it is uh -huh. important to remember that your brain is developing as a whole it is not saying that okay today or this hour i'm going to work only on motor and Very forget good. communication or you know sensory or whatever it is uh -huh. um and so it is um which is why i think pediatric therapists are um sort of they need that extra education continuing education apart from what we learn in our you know bachelors or masters um because there we are so focused only on the motor aspects you know so we need to widen our reading widen our you know interactions with other uh, clinicians that we work with other professionals that we work with so that you can understand how these things interact everything is going on simultaneously what you do in your session will affect what happens in the speech session will affect what happens with the aba what they do will affect your session so i think that's one thing i want you know everyone to sort of keep in mind um and exactly like ushma said you cannot you know pull out the co components uh, and say okay this is all i'm going to do uh, that's not how how it works uh, the other thing i wanted to say is um you know um again sensory and behavior if you look at how brain development occurs um all your uh, all the information that's coming from the environment and your body is also um that is where the mapping is happening right of your um, like the how your body is in space and all of those things um and that goes through through these uh structures that are responsible for memory for uh, you know the emotions the hypothalamus your limbic system they are passing through that there which is why there is such a, a close link between sensory and behavior right um and so again uh i guess the fundamental this is it is not separate irrespective of where you are uh, it is not separate it affects um, you know or that is how things work in your brain uh, especially in children uh, before they can think through you know and problem solve or come up with um, uh, the reason reasoning aspect you know which occurs uh, i don't know if you guys are aware but it occurs very very late in life uh, i i would say like 16 and up is where their prefrontal cortex is actually capable of uh, thinking or problem solving executive executive uh, i mean yeah higher executive skills higher right. executive and in advance like to say that okay if i don't do this right now what uh -huh. would be the consequence of something mm -hmm. right so till 16 17 years they are not the brains are just not ready for it and so if you are in a session and you are clueless the aba therapy therapist or the ot might be doing stuff to help with the uh, sensory behavior aspects but if you don't know how to do how to regulate this child in your session you are losing out on that 
30, 40 minutes uh, interaction that you have with this uh, family at that time. So yes, it's it's very critical that we are, you know, up to date. Up to date awesome. and aware. Thank you, Pooja. You said it all. You made my job much easier. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, going further from there, my favorite sentence that I tell to my parents, I would say, I don't even call my children, my patients anymore because they are not sick. You know, they are not sick and they don't. They come to me. Okay, maybe back pain, shoulder pain. I call them my patients, but children, I don't call them my patients because you know they are not really medically sick. Um, so, you know, my clients, I call them my clients and who are our clients, children, you can't talk to them directly. So you deal more with families. Again, parent coaching is a whole big thing. You know, it can be a whole big another webinar by itself. But what I tell my parents is that the same thing that in the brain, brain does not work like compartments. There are no compartments for behavior and sensory and motor and emotion and uh, eating and feeding and toileting. No, the brain works as a circuit, uh, you know, you know, circuit, meaning that if, you know, one part of the circuit is not working very well, the other parts do get impacted. Um, and at the same time, you can feed into the circuit, you know, based on the principles of neuroplasticity that we all know, you know, physios learn the principles of neuroplasticity quite, I think, in third year or fourth year, I'm not sure anymore. But, you know, we are all aware of neuroplasticity, meaning that the brain is plastic and you can create changes in the brain by challenging the brain. Ch and how do you challenge the brain is challenging the body because everything comes from the body. The more you use your body in different ways and meaningful ways changes occur in the brain so now what is motor what is sensory what is behavior i can only to make it very easy for all of you to understand i can uh, give you come up with a few examples that i see uh, you know routinely in my clinic so uh, uh, let's say a child with cerebral palsy you know most of you probably treat cerebral palsy as a condition a child with cerebral palsy um, is, you know, constantly shaking their hands like this or even just flapping like this. I've even seen children with cerebral palsy who are not walking. You know, they, they flap their feet, their foot, you know, when they're sitting in ring sitting, I can see their foot flap if they don't have tightnesses or spasticity or something. I've also seen some of the children with cerebral palsy or even uh, for that matter, traumatic brain injury. They're constantly shaking their head and saying, e you know. Now, what would you call this? Would you call this motor? Would you call this behavior? Would you call this sensory? What would you call this? Would you be able to just give one answer? Probably no. Most likely no. Yes, it is sensory. And why do you call it behavior? You call it behavior. Like I would write it in my report that the child presents with behaviors of hand flapping or head shaking or constant uh, vocalizations. I would write in my report. But I would not say that it's a, um, um, I mean, behavior that an ABA therapist needs to come in. Because I've seen many children toe walking, hand flapping. And, uh, you know, there are children who constantly vocalize, even children with CP, leave about autism, even children with CP constantly vocalizing, ah, e, constantly vocalizing, they are being sent to ABA therapists. Now, whether they should be sent or not is a different story. But for me, I would say no, they are more of sensory issues. And why are they sensory issues? I can give the reasons. And then parent will come and say, but ma'am, if I tell them to put the heels down, they will put the heels down. They will listen to me. Or if they ask them to stop flapping the hands, they will stop. Or if they ask them not to make a noise, they will listen to me. So then my next question to the parent is, are you going to be with the child all the time? No. The child is going to school. The child will maybe probably go to daycare or be with a teacher or be for a few hours with someone else. You, you as a mother are not going to be with a child for 24 hours, particularly when the child is three and four and five years of age. So what is the solution to this problem? So as far as I you know, said that some of these behaviors that children with CP demonstrate is 
they are not getting adequate movement they are not getting adequate self generated movement meaning parents will tell me oh i have you know parents of 6 and 7 year olds child with cp who carry them here like a sack but they don't have a stroller they don't have a wheelchair again our country is very vast we have various socio economic classes we have various living conditions i'm very mindful of all of that i'm not saying every child should have a wheelchair but i'm saying that every child should be moved in some way or the other so even a child with cerebral palsy i put them on a swing again in a safe manner of course <laughs> so i give them the swinging movement i put them on an office chair meaning you know the the swivel chair or the revolving chair give them some movement if possible and the parent can either buy a wheelchair if not a wheelchair you know wheelchair takes maybe weeks to come i'm like okay get a stroller buy a used stroller for the size of the child and every day take the child for a walk in the stroller you know if the child is totally dependent but if the child has a capacity to walk then the child should be walking using a walker whatever type of walker that is suitable for the child's capacity because that there is another myth we have in india that no i don't want my child to have a walker because then my child will never learn to walk on their own this is a myth this is a myth okay you can't wait for years thinking that the child will ever wa uh, walk on their own intermediately you have to give them a walker you uh, have to give means you just don't give them you train them or you train the family and you give them a walker so once a child starts walking with a walker even with minimal assist or more assist from you there is self generated movement the point that i came to there is some self generated movement and then you see these behaviors less i give the movement through pedler you know what a pedler is like a stationary bike uh, which does not have a seat it only has pedals uh, i've written a blog post on it i i have shared it many times i'll share it again on the group on the let's talk pediatrics group please read that on a pedler i have them pedal their arms so i put the pedler on a table or somewhere and you know have the pedal their arms i put the peddler on the floor and have them sit on a suitable high chair suitable for them to peddle again they won't do it all you may you will have to help them sometimes two people will have to help them most of the time two people have will have to help them to start with but once you get movement what do you get you get movement means you get not only you're working on muscles you're also working on vestibular you're working on proprioception so this is just the initiation of what i'm saying i mean there's a whole lot of science you know behind this but is it sensory or is it behavior you cannot put them in water tight compartments or separate compartments you have to look at them together and do the detective work as to how much is it sensory how much is it behavior okay so anybody has any question on this please come in you can unmute yourself and come in anybody at all okay have you seen children with cerebral palsy having sensory issues according to you you may be right or wrong don't worry about that according to you have you seen children with cerebral palsy who have so called sensory issues or behaviors you can write in the chat box or you can unmute yourself whatever you are comfortable with are all students though or therapists like working therapists or students oh i'm not sure i'm not sure can you type in the chat box everyone's very quiet yeah. yes <laughs> okay so pooja you want to add something on this hmm. um i mean i was hoping for some conversation but yeah um so i guess uh, for me it it works a little differently in the sense because i work with uh, 
preterm babies who yes. are already, uh, you know, at risk for all of these things, mm -hmm. um, especially given. Um, so I just maybe let me go back a couple of steps and just explain what mm -hmm. uh, or how sensory processing works. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first thing is obviously to know that any information that comes from the body or the environment that you use in order to get a response is what sensory processing is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, so like Ushma said, we have nine, you know, oh, I'm sorry, eight systems uh, now in the sensory processing, like under that umbrella. Um, mainly as motor therapists, we uh, are, you know, uh, or we use vestibular probe tactile mm -hmm. and vision. Mm -hmm. We don't use so much auditory, even though we do, but we don't realize that we, we do. do, but we don't realize. Yeah. Doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, however, in the NICU, obviously, we also use a lot of, um, uh, you know, the smell, the taste, because mm -hmm. we're doing feeding and we are doing, you know, kangaroo mother care and all of these things. So, um, you know, in the, um, in the, I mean, sorry, in the sort of realm of sensory processing, you need to know that if um, information coming from all of these things itself is not um, adequate adequate or it no, is because well because or, or not being processed well because uh, you know she sees children who are preemies and preemies depending on how preemie they are the systems are not that well developed okay like vestibular is a fully developed system by birth uh, so called normal you know pregnancy and birth but probe generally uh, gets developed in the last 4 weeks of pregnancy so let's say if a child is born before 36 or 35 weeks you know uh, in short i mean uh, before that then you can immediately see probe issues well well into when the child is even four, five, six, seven, I see. And Puja would be seeing it probably right away in the NICU. Right. Now, I was just saying that, hmm. you know, the information. So we are saying that if what is coming in gets processed and therefore you get a good output. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so I'm trying to put things in context for you know people listening is that when what information is coming in also matters right so mm -hmm. there is just one aspect of maturity and exposure or uh you know readiness of the system itself but um you know in the nicu particularly there is a lot of extra information with some systems and not enough from the other systems yes so yes. that itself lends to this higher risk of uh, uh, sort of a bad outcome or not bad outcome. That's not actually the right thing, but uh, uh, higher risk of sensory processing concerns, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what is coming in is, itself is not right. Um, and then comes the, so there are three sections in my mind. So one is what is coming in. Then one mm -hmm. is what is happening with that information. So mm -hmm. again, for anything to be processed, the first thing your brain and body wants to know is, is it safe? Mm -hmm. You know, if mm -hmm. I'm not feeling safe and comfortable with the information, I do not even want to look at it. I don't want to know what it is. I don't want to use it. I don't want to have anything to do with it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where, again, therapy in the NICU really comes uh, handy where we are trying to make sure that uh, there are certain things we need to do anyway because um, you know, like we can't we can't have a procedure on hold simply because it's a negative, uh, you know, uh, process, right? So, uh -huh. but we can have other things that will help lower the negative impact of that pro procedure, um, you know, while that's happening. So, in multiple ways, we do that. But anyway, so. So that's the aspect of processing. You need to first be safe. You need to understand what it is. Yes. Uh, you need to be able to figure out uh, details of what it is. For example, like <coughs> vision, right? Uh, a newborn is not really, uh, uh, they don't have the 20-20 vision, uh, but it develops after a few weeks. So what you do in those first two weeks 
versus what you do over the next you know two months changes mm -hmm. um and that is again understanding this process of development how you know when to do what um and so that's so input processing and then your output which is what output. you know we see as behavior that's how I look at it when I'm working. You know, if I'm looking at a behavior, I try to sort of pull it back, back, back towards like, you know, okay, what else could be happening? Is the information going in right or not? You know, whatever. Um, so, so basically that's, you know, uh, how I look at uh, sensory sort of or behavior in terms of the NICU or um, you know uh, early intervention. The other thing I wanted to just say is that this is where um, you know the like like I was saying earlier that all information processed through your uh, limbic system, you know your hypothalamus, your cere cerebellum, uh, which contributes to this uh, attachment bonding, you know uh, uh, sort of aspects of life as well. Again, for security, you know, for that uh, safe safety, which then leads to, you know, or it allows the brain to have the space of, okay, I know I'm fine here. So let me look around and then take in more, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so another aspect of um, this is just like we struggle in our sessions to deal with sensory or behavior issues. The parent is sort of uh, doing that for a longer duration or almost all day, you know. So again, um, I have a little more time and flexibility because I do a lot of anticipatory stuff as well. I'm not waiting for a diagnosis to occur and then start treating. We know the risk. So we are doing a lot of anticipatory preventive stuff as well, which allows me time to have conversations with the parents and do a lot of trial and error right? A lot of, like, all mothers, this is so amazing, right? A, a mother who has had no interaction with an infant before she became a mother, but the moment she has the baby and the baby starts crying, they will all do this, right? It's so instinctual. Um, and so just having conversations that allow the parents to also figure out how they can help the child, um, you know, like, give the sensory you know uh, uh, inputs so that they can regulate their behavior as well so that's something that really fascinates me in the NICU and, and uh, you know, <laughs> the early like here uh, we have a question Ushma we can actually yes I know that. I know so yeah I said I you know I'm talking about children who are younger but when this question is about a 13 year old boy and I think the ther 13 year old boy with cerebral palsy and the therapist says that he has voluntary body movements anterior, anteriorly and posteriorly in sitting position. So I am assuming the child is doing this. Okay. When I told he, when I tell him he stops, this is exactly what I mean. That nobody is going to tell him to stop all the time. Are you going to be there? Are you, or is the mother going to be there? So now probably you may not eliminate. Now this, since the child is thirteen. I would call it more of a behavior, but it has a sensory cause, you know, that has been there since years. I would like to know more about this child with cerebral palsy, whether the child is ambulatory. If he is ambulatory, how does he ambulate with, uh, uh, with um, assistance from someone? Uh, and even if he's ambulatory, how many times a day is he being ambulated? Because remember, movement is 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 the key thing to stopping such kind of behaviors as this this involuntary behavior. This is a movement seeking behavior. Okay, if you and I I ask you to still sit still for three hours in a day for three hours in a lecture room, I say don't budge. In an hour, actually, you will start moving. In fact, even during this webinar, you will start moving a little bit because. That is the body's natural instinct to seek out movement. Uh, um, human body was not made to sit still. Human body was made to move. So this is one way. The person has asked me, what is the cause? The cause is this child is seeking vestibular input. Now, there are many ways of giving vestibular input to this child. You can make him walk frequently many times a day. 
you can uh, make him ride a stationary bicycle if he has the capacity again i don't know anything about this boy how much trunk control he has how does he sit i really don't know anything else about this i uh, would refer to an ot or i mean i since i do you know i am a sensory certified person and experienced person in sensory even for cp children i do similar treatment what i do to autism you know because we don't treat conditions we treat symptoms so i do a lot of work with hands in these children then they stop seeking movement so a lot of work with hands is you know i have them fix i mean hundreds of things i have them fix pegs at times uh, at times i have them play with shaving foam i have them you know pull and push connector pipes uh, i mean many many things uh, i i have them do depending on what their capacity is so uh, uh, you know the cause of this is the child is not moving enough you know um, and once you give them that movement you just see that the frequency of this moving anteriorly and posteriorly frequency means how many times a day and how long do they move at a particular time will slowly reduce you can see that um, somebody else has asked a, a, a question pain of any origin seizure lack of variety in movements or some other reasons causing behavior issues exactly yes yes they are again hunger lack of sleep but again hunger lack of sleep are a little temporary right i mean or constipation um then coming back to pooja's question that's safe i don't think as therapists we know what is safe you know you will you may have heard pooja or you may hear me say what is safe children are safe we are not talking only about safety from sexual abuse or physical abuse or anything like that i mean of course that definitely children <laughs> cannot be go, uh, you know have to go through that we are talking about safety meaning when therapists are yelling at children when therapists are threatening children i have had videos sent from remote parts of the country where actually a physiotherapist he may be a quack physiotherapist i'm sure he was actually caning a child caning a child with cp a child who could not even sit he was caning him to ask him to crawl meaning you know that the child is crawling on the floor like a uh, like a military crawling i mean that was outright abuse and and i don't think that was a physiotherapist but these things are happening in a, in our country so when we say safe meaning that a child has to feel comfortable in the environment imagine you when somebody threatens you all the time verbally or um, you know threatens you to punish you all the time and imagine you know sensorically if the room is too hot or the room is too noisy the room is too well extremely lighted or even less lighted you know how would you feel even as a let's say called a neurotypical human being you may function in these conditions for a while but after a while you will also start having behaviors okay you will also start showing behaviors so when we mean safe you know that is what i you know we meant by safety again we are not going to add on too much on this because safety you know feeling safe in therapy getting bonded in therapy with the therapist and getting bonded with the parent because today you know the children uh, of age whom i see the parents are more hooked on academics the child should know colors the child should know numbers the child should know a b c d the child should know writing and in that quest the parents uh, i don't know really they 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 don't attach to the child there is no attachment or bonding or very poor bonding and attachment they just want the child to do do fix puzzles learn a b c fix puzzles this is not the way therapy can and that's where my parent coaching comes in uh, just like yesterday a, a child was supposed to match you know colored buttons you know just red green blue and yellow they know their buttons fine i mean they know the colors basic colors but then they don't know how to apply it so it's a cognitive skill it's a category you know categorization it's a subset of cognitive skills the child is still learning the child is five but is still learning and the parent is very eager to yellow yellow look here is yellow you have to put it yellow here 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 is green here you have to put green here and i'm like i'm in you know i see the child and the child has colored button let's say red the child is putting on green 
and the child is thinking for a second, oh, this is not matching. Then the child goes on another color, oh, this is not matching. The child goes on a third color, this is not matching. And finally, when the child comes to red, the child fixes there. So there I, you know, I start coaching the parent. I'm like, look, give the child some time. It is not about fixing the right colors or completing the activity. Therapy is not about completing the activity. It is not what they do. It is how they do. When the child is pausing at every color to see whether it's matching, the brain is thinking whether it's the right color or not. The visual, the vision system is trying to match, you know, the button to the whatever background color was there. So parents are so eager to complete the activity. And sometimes I even see young therapists do that. It's not your fault. It's the way that it's taught to you that if you do this 10 times, or if you do this 15 times, or if you do this five times, you know, that's therapy. That's not therapy. You, you know, the brain, it, it is more important to learn the how rather than the what. So the analogy I'll give you is in a yoga posture, for example, a most difficult posture called Shirsasan. Is it all about getting to the Shirsasan? No. I mean, doing the Shirsasan? No. It is about how, what steps are you taking to get into the Shirsasan? And that takes time. It doesn't happen in an hour or a day or even a week, you know, a difficult posture like Shirsasan. I mean, that's the best example I can give you right now. So I start coaching the parents right away that, you know, give the child to think. And if the child matches the wrong color, I would say, let's see, correct it, correct it. Don't say wrong, wrong, no, no. It's sending negative messages to the child. I'm like, okay, let's correct, let's correct it. Let's see where it goes. Be positive, send positive messages because that's again where the child feels, you know, that feeling of bonding, attachment, not negative all, you know, most of the time. And also, according to motor learning, that's what I learned. You learn more by mistakes. The brain learn more by making mistakes rather than doing it correctly all the time. There are motor learning studies, research studies that have shown that. Okay. So, um, yes, somebody else says the pain of any origin, yes, that can also cause behavior issues. So, if a child has behavior issues in your session, you try to be a detective. Detective meaning you try to analyze, you try to think about today in this session, what caused this behavior? Was this behavior there during all the sessions so far? Is it worse today? Is it lesser today? Or uh, why, if it is worse, why is it worse? You know, you have to see, you know, in behavior, uh, they say that you see ABC, meaning antecedent behavior and consequence. So. If a child has behavior, what triggered the behavior? And then let's say they want a toy or something and you give it to them. So if you give the toy, that's a consequence. Does that behavior come down? Okay, so there goes your ABC, antecedent, behavior and consequence. That gives you a step up to do what next? To do what next? And if it is sensory, there are many sensory issues. Um, I mean, there could be issues in all the systems except for proprioception. In propri there are three kinds of sensory issues. In, you know, a child can be dysregulated in three different ways for each system, except for proprioception could be only one or two. But there are 24 different ways. There are eight systems and let's say three, three types of dysregulatory behaviors in every system. So there are nearly 22 to 23 types of, you know, dysregulatory reasons why a child would have sensory issues and why some of it could have behavior. Now, here there's another question. I have seen one autistic child having 12 years of age. Sometimes he has shown aggressive behavior. Suddenly, he tried to bite if you oppose him. What might be the reason? Child trying to bite. I think the child is nonverbal or minimally verbal or not able to express or somebody hit that child or somebody took away something from that child or he was not given what he wants. So now I'm not here to say that you give the child everything what he wants at all the times, then he won't bite. I'm not saying that. However, there is some sort of conditioning in all kinds of therapy, right? That you try to communicate with the child. Uh, now this brings me to another question. If the child is nonverbal, 
uh, and uh, you know nowadays we have uh, something called AAC alternate uh, augmentative and alternate communication basically it's a form of digital communication India has its own three four apps the um, most popular app is Avas uh, you know the middle class can afford it very very well okay but the problem is that most parents uh, and by uh, for that matter most speech therapists never talk to parents that it's highly likely that the child you know communication expressive communication will come even if it comes the child may not speak in sentences you know to express what he wants all the time or what is happening to him all the time so then the child needs AAC, that is, you know, digital communication. Or if the parents can't afford, then, you know, sometimes pictures. But there has to be a way of communication established. So when I'm when we are talking about sen motor, we talk about sensory. When we are talking about sensory, we also talk about behavior. When we talk about behavior, we also have to co talk about communication, not speech. Speech is what I'm doing right now. Communication means how do two people communicate? Even if you don't know each other's language, how do you communicate? You communicate by gestures, signs, non-verbal non -verbal gestures means I'm angry or I'm sad or, you know, I'm happy with what you gave me, even if I don't know your language. But our children with autism, you know, they have difficulty in, in reading non-verbal cues. So then this alternative augmentative communication is very important. And sadly, parents spend years thinking one day the child will speak, which is unfortunately may not happen. And then if they don't have a way of communication, biting, aggression, all this happens. All of this happens. Particularly a 12-year-old. Remember, 12-year-old child, 13-year-old child, they are in the pre-teens or almost teens. They are going through a lot of hormonal changes, just like all other kids who are going through hormonal changes of that age. So even that factor, you have to bear in mind. You have to be more patient with them. Hormones are aging in their bodies, you know, in the teenage years. And it starts during the adolescent or the preteen years. So we cannot ignore that factor. We need to be more patient with them. Those years, at least have that in the background. Aggression, uh, I mean, aggression is a slightly strong word, but aggression, anger are nowadays so-called normal in neurotypical children are going through the teenage years and the preteen years. So anybody else, any more questions? What is the importance of history when we plan management or activities? Oh, a lot. History has to do a lot. Um, I have children, whether they come to me at two years, three years, seven years, or even nine years, although I don't see older children, but I do have children who come to me for handwriting and attention, you know, seven and nine years. I can see in their history. I ask them, you know, how they were born, how was the pregnancy, how were their developmental milestones. Most parents will say development developmental milestones were all fine, or they may say that, oh, they were only one month behind or two months behind, which is okay. However, nowadays I've developed my favorite line of talking to parents. It's just not checking off milestones. It is everything in between also. I... At the beginning of this uh, webinar, I said, right, that the further pre, uh, premature the babies are, we have more issues in not only the motor systems, that is achieving the motor milestones, but also in the sensory systems. And sensory, it's not only the eight systems, but sensory systems, when they are not very well developed, they also cause a lot of social emotional problems. Remember, the brain is a circuit. And sensation is the foundation of everything we do in life. Particularly the vestibular, the probe and the tactile, they are called the power sensations. So when they are not very well developed in life, and the child has achieved many things. The child has already spoken. I have had children who also uh, go to mainstream schools, but by second standard, third standard, they start having issues of aggression, anger, handwriting, attention. They get sent to me for handwriting. But I, as a therapist, when I evaluate them, when I see them, when I ask so many questions, when I ask the child to do so many things, I see impulsivity. I see 
they are a little confused in making some right decisions as age appropriately. And therefore they end up um, having inappropriate, inappropriate social emotional behavior in the classroom. So sensory is the foundation of all. Um, there is another question. So, so yeah, history, birth history. So that's where I said C-section. Um, I think it's come out in the research, but more than research, there are books that children who are born through C-section are may may have vestibular issues in future. Um, so birth history, it has to do because I said you know that many sensory systems are developed at birth, fully developed at birth. However, we need to further make them stronger and stronger. Vestibular system is one, probe is one. So if the birth history is significant for prematurity, for a lot of medical issues, for uh, let's say uh, issues with mother like fetal alcoholic syndrome or substance abuse, uh, all of this can uh, the cascade into the child having sensory issues and later, you know, the socio emotional developmental milestones. So, yes, birth history is very important. Even the environment after birth is important. I do have some children with birth history and nothing I found significant, but the environment after birth, meaning neglect, um, what you call screen time, excessive screen time, excessive meaning right from six to eight months, the child was given six to eight hours of screen time per day. There was no connection with the parent because the parents were never there. or this, So that means there was no bonding with the mother or the mother was always pre preoccupied with the screen. So there was no connection with the parent. Pooja is the right person to talk more about it. Although I talk about it a lot to parents, even when children who come to me at four and five years of age, at first build a connection with the child. Pooja can talk more because she deals with it right from day zero, you know, in the, in the NICU. I come in late into the picture. But birth history matters. Birth history meaning pregnancy, birth meaning antenatal, perinatal, and even postnatal, you know up to first year, up to three years, all matters. Um, there is one more question that has come. I have a child who is six years old with autism. She constantly lies in prone position, placing her hand under her head and starts banging her head on her arm. What can be done for this issue? She is nonverbal, right? There you go. If she's nonverbal, it could be sensory seeking, meaning it could be appropriate seeking through the head and the neck. It could also be a communication issue. Now, whether sensory is more or communication, both are present, but in what level? It depends at different times. And as she grows older, it would be more of a communication issue. Uh, she's already six. So as she grows older, this head banging is more of a communication issue. So I'm not saying when it's more of a communication, sensory has been resolved. I'm not saying that, mind you, but it is more of a communication. Um, in, in this, it could also be a visual issue, you know, mind you, because <laughs> the vestibular is also connected to the visual systems. The vestibular is connected to the, um, what you call postural system. So there is no one right answer for all of this. Now, she constantly lies in prone position. She lies in prone is because she's just, she's just yielding to gravity. She can't, you know, she can't bang her head in sitting unless she hits herself. If you ever see children who are head banging, they go in prone, they go down to the floor because it's easier to head bang there, as simple as that. If they do head banging in, in vertical position like us, you know, they'll do this. Understood? As simple as that. I, somebody sent me a question. I think that person is not here, but I will still answer that question because it is quite important. I think they said that they had, they were treating a um, child with cerebral palsy. And uh, when he tries to make the child sit, the child goes in extension. That's what, that's what, uh, you know, they had told me. 
So I've had similar children like that and I'll try to answer the question. I think the child was cerebral palsy. So uh, what that person's question was that uh, they were treating a child with cerebral palsy and when they were trying to make that child sit, the child would go into constant extension. They didn't tell me how old the child was, so I don't know. But I had, uh, I started treating a four-year-old child like that, you know, recently. And the reason there could be many things. The child could be showing morose reflex, you know, in response to loud sound or loud environment or something he doesn't like in the environment or some somebody's touch, you know, the therapist touches new. Till the child came to me, the child probably was not touched by anybody else except the mother or the father so the child would have perceived the touch as a threatening thing even though I'm very I'm very uh, soft I don't really go and touch children like that but still even with experience sometimes you know things happen and you know the child would just do this so that could be one reason the other reason would be the child was very tactile defensive he would never hold anything in the hands and this is a child would flap their hands all the time so if we tried to put an object in their hand, they would immediately withdraw and they would go like this. Um, they would not even sit on a bench. And I was afraid of sitting them on the bench, meaning a six, six inch height bench, because he would go all this time. So how did I start treatment? I started treatment is, um, and, and simply the reason the child doesn't want to be there. The child wants to be with the mother. So I tried, I generally start my treatment with the mother being in the session or even the mother watching the session very close by or little distance whatever but uh, recently there has been a change you know some of the children really don't cooperate when the mother is around particularly this child so the mother only gave me an idea that she will sit behind the curtain and the first thing we did is to make the child feel safe and comfortable the mother uh, played out the child's favorite song some animal song in Canada behind the curtain again, not in front of him. So the child sort of, you know, uh, and the child had poor vision also. So the child felt safe. Oh, this is my favorite song, you know. And the child started cooperating with us. And then we started trying different things rather than, you know, going right into therapy. I started placing different things in his hands and very tactile sensitive. Finally, we found bottles, you know, plastic bottles, bottles that, you know, thrown away, water bottles, small, medium, big. We put it in the child's both hands, not in one hand, both hands. Remember, hands in midline is again a very safe position for children. And probably nobody had done that because the child was just being fed and, you know, taken care of. So we just put a bottle in between his two palms and, you know, the bottle was filled with water and taped so the bottle won't leak. But the child felt good because the bottle felt cool and the bottle felt a little heavy. Not that he was holding it. We were holding it for him. But he perceived that this bottle is a little heavy. And that calmed him down a little bit. And then, you know, we took on. Then we did many things over the two years. But we took on from there. So that safe starting point. Again, when the mother stopped playing that Kannada song after a few sessions, one of my non-clinical staff who's very good at singing songs in Canada. She started singing. So there was a change, you know, from the mother, from the phone to a different person. My staff singing the same song in her voice, meaning a different voice. And the child accepted it. And then later we started singing, you know, other songs like Lakade Ki Kati and whatever. So the child started accepting even our voice, you know, no matter how we sung. So this is the way we progressed, you know, from his favorite Kannada rhyme on a phone to some new person singing that song in their own voice to different songs in Hindi with different voices. This is how we progressed. He felt safe and he started cooperating and he stopped this extension behavior uh, within like two months, two, two to three months, you know, and I just see children twice a week. So uh, you can imagine just like 24 sessions, 25 sessions. So this is how you progress. Okay. What to do? Puja, next question is for you. Can you see the chat box or should I read it out for you? I see okay. it. Oh, you can see it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So, first thing to remember is that prone is a very uh, powerful position 
and it is actually the best uh, physiological position that uh, you know infants should be in however when they are born they are never put in prone immediately right except for if uh, the hospital uh, or the birthing center um, is following the rules for the golden hour. They will have the baby uh, skin to skin on the mother's chest for, you know, sometime after, immediately after birth. Uh, but that's like a very brief uh, exposure to prone that the baby has. And um, what happens generally is that in utero, you don't really um, understand what gravity is. Um, and, you know, so when the baby is out, that's why, again, tummy time has to be done consistently from day one, because it is a gradual acceptance of uh, gravity when the baby isn't prone. Obviously, the head is the heaviest part of the body in the first two years. Um, and so lifting it up or, you know, using it for vision, for vestibular, um, all of these things uh, is difficult, right? But if you, uh, if you look at, like, we have a couple of lovely videos of babies uh, doing tummy dive right from birth on, um, on my YouTube, uh, you know, on Facebook as well, I think. Um, you'll see that they have enough strength initially, like for the first week or 10 days, um, they have enough strength to actually lift their heads up and, you know, engage with the parent who's face to face. But if this time has passed without the child being on their tummy, um, then, you know, the body has learned to move against gravity in a very different manner. And so if you start tummy time late, uh, generally, you will see a lot of these uh, resistance, you know, to uh, staying on the tummy for a while. The other thing I see is that parents will place the baby on the tummy and they will not have engagement during that, you know, during that um, activity. So remember, it is a play activity. It is not just a position. You're not just leaving the baby there and, you know, doing whatever you need to do. There has to be engagement and this engagement has to be such that you are face to face with the baby. Okay. Um, when I say that, again, a lot of parents will go on the bed. This is not an activity for the bed. It has to be on the floor. Okay. There, I, I think Ushma and I, we have done one. We webinar. have done. It's on our YouTube tummy time. Yes. So I can share the link see, on the group. Yeah. yeah. Please go and see what the benefits are of tummy time. We have, you know, spent a whole hour uh, on this topic there. But what I'm trying to say is that it is, everything is practice. When you're learning something, there is time required and there is practice required. So if you haven't given that, there is going to be, uh, you know, some uh, resistance from the infant because it's so easy for the baby to lay in, in supine and look around, right? They don't have to make any effort. Yeah. Versus in prone, you're actually working out. It's a good workout, right? Um, so there needs to be good engagement. The other third thing that I find which really triggers this crying response when babies are put in uh, prone is that they get lifted, right? So they get lifted in supine and then they get flipped over in air and then they get put down. And so this lack of uh, connect to the floor, which is their point of contact, which is where they are, um, uh, you know, like for us, right? Um, I don't know, I, I was just trying to think what example I could give, but we are always like our ground is, I mean, our, flow, uh, our feet are always on the ground, isn't it? And that gives us that sense of balance where we are in space. Uh, like if we wanted to, I don't know, walk on like a rope bridge or things like that, it becomes difficult for us, right? And so we need a lot of vision uh, or we need a lot of tactile, this to keep our uh, sense of um, to hold on the support, body in space, support. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need these extra sensory information to be able to orient ourselves and to feel comfortable in, uh, you know, that that uh, situation. And so when you do that, when you lift the kid up and flip them in the air and bring them down, a lot of time that triggers this um, thing of unsafe or what happened, what just happened to my body, you know. 
um, and you're bringing the kid down, you know, on your speed and not the child's speed. Uh, so again, self-initiated movement is better accepted than uh, externally initiated movement, right? Um, so all of these things contribute to this um, hating tummy time, you know, in my opinion. So if we can look at, you know, what has happened, uh, where this kid is resisting, why? Um, of course, and all of this, I am not even talking about kids with neurological issues, tone issues, you know, seizures. Uh, maybe they've had uh, uh, abdominal surgery or they've had, um, you know, uh, things on the uh, front of the um, what is the, uh, trunk happened to them in an NICU, which is why they are not uh, happy in prone, not happy having that uh, tactile, you know, um, what do you say, information on the front of their bodies. So I'm not talking about all of that. That will have a whole different uh, way of approach and, uh, you know, working with, with that baby and family. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just have a couple of things to add to all the previous discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go ahead. One is that, um, you know, this, the first question that was the 13-year-old uh, that was sort of rocking back and forth and sitting, and he would stop when you ask and, you know, so mm -hmm. I, as a therapist, I feel like first thing we need to figure out is, is it blocking any function? Because while I was sitting and listening to Ushma for whatever, 20 minutes, uh, you rocking. know, I I'm also rocking, like, yes. We yeah, like to move. Exactly, exactly, right? So if it is not impacting any function, if they are uh, just, you know, they are sitting there bored, not engaged, and then they are rocking, I wouldn't even, you know. Yeah. Thank you. That. Thank you, Puja, for adding yeah. that. I, forgot. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with that. In fact, uh -huh. if a parent is bringing up something like that, I would direct, again, their attention towards function that, yeah. you know, if, if the rocking is blocking something from happening, right? That, okay, I need to put my shoes on, but I can't do that because I need to rock. Then we work on the rocking, but otherwise who cares? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, yes. so there and comes our function, function right. alignment. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Um, and there was another, uh, hang on. Uh, forget uh, anyway but i just wanted to say that you know there are again if you look at sensory there are two ways again i look at it i mm -hmm. uh, i don't proclaim to be an expert in this uh, but this is how i you know problem solve for myself whether it is hardware or software okay mm -hmm. if there is a, a brain insult or if there is a diagnosis particularly that leads to developmental issues right then i i label that as hardware and there then remember those three sections I mentioned where input, processing, output. So then that input is where the hardware issue is. What is coming in itself is not being able to like process in the right step. way. Yeah, move to the yeah. next step in the right manner, right? Um, so I feel like that is something that will keep recurring. So se session after session, right? So like, for example, CP, I think of as hardware, right? It is something that has happened and it's not changing. So um, a child with, say, um, I don't know how to... Mm, 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 so this rocking again, right? So the rocking is just because the child has not moving enough that self-initiated moving is not enough and it is never going to be enough, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. that will, it may be not rocking always, it will move to say leg shaking, hand flapping, whatever. It will switch over time. But those kind of things come from the fact that there's a problem with the way the information is itself. And then the software is obviously the processing where, you know, all the ASDs, the LDs. So there's nothing wrong with the body structures. Uh, there's nothing wrong with how, you know, the, um, you know, what do you say? The information coming in is, is coming in fine, but then something is wrong with the circuitry okay. in the brain itself that is not allowing you to have a, you know, uh, good output. And so for that, I feel like that's something that uh, sensory, uh, you know, uh, integration work uh, can make a huge difference because once they can learn how to, process what is coming in correctly 
you will see a huge change in the uh, you know behavior but with with things like hardware it's like every session you, you might have to start fresh in terms of sensory you know information does that no, make sense no until until they learn to use their own body so i think puja what you were saying is that um, so okay let's take cerebral palsy cerebral palsy has primary sensory issues and secondary sensory issues both okay so this child who is rocking or you know lack of movement is us the behavior of rocking is a secondary sensory issue what i would call but there are many children who have primary sensory issues also let's say for example hemiplegia you know hemiplegia is a form of cerebral palsy you know hemiplegia in children it's a subcategory of cp so in hemiplegia the child will have primary as well as secondary let's say the left side of the body is you know has paresis or ple plegia or whatever you call but second they have they will have secondary sensory issues because uh, you know they will uh, they are over sensitive to touch they will not use this arm so much and therefore they become over sensitive to touch however they also have primary sensory issues because a child with hemiplegia has not undergone the primary you know that um, hand to knee motor pattern uh, normal pattern of normal development and that hand to knee when it doesn't happen hand to knee and hand to foot if it doesn't happen within 5 to 6 months of age children develop tactile issues okay this is all evidence based research okay so children with cp can have primary as well as secondary sensory yeah. issues and when well, i, I say a child with hemi uh, no no so when i say child with hemiplegia i treat many children who as they grow older 4 5 6 when i have them do comfortably touch their other hand deal with their other arm comfortably do bilateral coordination basically all part of sensory integration or i call my therapy now sensory motor therapy when we have them do all this comfortably you know not just stretching strengthening etc no weight bearing see weight bearing we do it as a part of motor therapy but weight bearing is sensory if you think about it only when you weight bear you feel something right oh the hand is taking weight or the elbow is taking weight weight bearing is kinesthetic sense you know in which direction is your joint moving your you know your your uh, 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 limb is moving so some of the things we call is that is it sensory is it motor is it both this is what i have come to the conclusion and also as a child grows older coming back to my point when you treat both sides so you don't treat only the hemiplegic side you also bring in the good side and remember even the good side is not all that good in all the children or people with hemiplegia it's not that totally normal okay so when you work on both sides of the body together whether in the lower extremities and in the upper extremities and the trunk through the sensory pathways you will see a big difference you will see a big difference okay again that just stretching strengthening causing pain children with hemiplegia who can verbalize have actually said that oh you know that therapy was causing a lot of pain i think nobody should verbalize like that i mean we should not give them an opportunity to verbalize like that therapy has to be the least painful or not painful at all particularly for children not only physically not even emotionally therapy has to be play fun function these are the three things any therapy pt ot speech done through play done through you know to address function and the child should feel fun every child is right to have fun every child just as we do so can i go to the next question puja before we wrap up then there's one more question yes. we'll take yeah yes yes so this is a child of 5 years who tries to run away when i try to do whatever in the session he is minimally verbal there's an impulsive aggression uh, whenever we try to make him write hold a pencil crayon or something similar so <laughs> there are two points in this there are many points but the two points one which relates to puja's that thing you know the tummy time you flip them in the air and you bring them down same thing with a 4 or 5 year or even a 3 year i see in therapy parents my clinic now is on the first floor parents carry even a 4 or 5 year old child even though the child is able to walk okay 
autism, child with autism, nothing wrong with the hardware, as Pooja said. I mean, not nothing wrong. Maybe they have hypotonia, maybe they have subtle things, but they can walk and they can climb upstairs. Still, even a five-year-old, I see parents carrying and bringing to my clinic. And then they'll put them down in the therapy area like this. That's it. If you were in the child's position, how would you feel? Oh my God, I got transported from the parent's hands or the lap or whatever <laughs> to suddenly <laughs> on the floor to do things. That's an emotional response. That's why they're trying to run away. So the first thing I told, I tell parents is, you know, make them climb my stairs or even better, leave your auto or vehicle, you know, some 100 feet away or something, make the child walk, come and, you know, get to my therapy. I mean, these are small points. Whether they apply to you or not, I don't know. But I mean, I learned the hard way that this is what parents are doing. Just bringing up the child, dropping them in the therapy area. And obviously the child is going to cry. He tries to run away from the activities. You know what I think? If this child is five years, he may not have had therapy before. Or he may not be finding fun in therapy. So first, make that connection, make that bonding by offering him fun things and also explain to the parent. First, build that comfort zone between you and the child rather than just making him do things, okay? Find out what toy or what object gives him comfort. I don't encourage this all the time, but sometimes, you know, children have a certain chart paper, like a chart of vegetables, or uh, as long as it's not a car or a plane, meaning something with wheels, I will let them get a doll or one Lego block that they can hold. Okay, if, if they want to. Some children will come holding a bottle like this, you know, a bottle, a water bottle. They'll come holding like this and I let them keep the bottle. I don't take it away from them. I know it interferes with function for some time in using both hands, but because that is comfort for them, it gives them proprioception and it gives them safety. I let them hold for a while, okay? So try such things. Build that comfort zone with the child. Uh, you said there's an impulsive aggression that comes from him whenever we try to make him write, hold a pencil. Writing, holding a pencil, crayon is such a big issue. Um, all parents want it. But parents don't understand that there is a lot of pre-writing, pre-writing -pre preparation. The child has to go through physically. Um, you know, for the hands, um, elbow, shoulders, trunk, emotionally meaning be ready to write. So you have to do a lot of pre-writing activities with the hands first. And don't be surprised if more than 60% of your autism population is not using hands. I see it right in the first session, yes, due to my experience, but parents will tell me, no ma'am. It is not only one atta. Child has no problem touching anything. Child needs variety and variety of textures, substances. You know how children used to uh, get raised in villages in ancient India? Stones, leaves, grass, bricks, <laughs> climbing trees. I mean, you name it. They would play in the mud all day. This is what childhood should have been, which is not, not being. Now it's only Atta or Play-Doh. And parents will know hands are fine. Later parents themselves observe, yes, ma'am, he's not using hands. And using hands doesn't mean you have to have fancy toys. You can have the child just make a tower of, you know, cups, plastic cups, steel, steel glasses, steel katoris. I mean, there is so much you can do, you can watch my uh, video on my YouTube therapeutic activities. That also you can watch. There is so much material that is actually a waste and going to be thrown away, which I use in my clinic first. I show the parents how to use it and then they use it and, you know, use it the right way uh, before throwing. And that reduces the tactile sensitivity little by little, gradually. Little by little. Uh, Pooja, you also have your website. Is, if it is accessible, then let's put it on the group for, you know, videos yeah. or whatever. We will put but it on I the Let's Talk Pediatric uh, group. Sure, sure. Hmm? I don't have too much for the older kids, but I just want to say. But no, but babies, yeah. Um, you know, uh, there are uh, so many questions, like people are putting up these cases. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, 
you know, what have you done to create an attachment with that child? Yes. Right? Ask you, I feel that. like everyone, you know, wants a solution. A quick solution. Yeah. That yeah, like what should we do? But look at what you have done mm -hmm. and see what you can change in that first before adding something new. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I always give this example of like, you know, when you watch a cooking show on TV, you know, they, you're like, oh, I have these ingredients in my kitchen, but it will not turn out the way that it sh shows up on TV and what you do, you know, even though the ingredients are the same, because you have to practice and practice and get creative with yeah. using yeah. that to get to that stage, you know. So asking for strategies, I feel like is like we are coming from what you have written in two lines we are trying yeah. to get, you know a discussion going but my first thing is self reflection okay go back sit down and think of what you have done with this child in the last five or six sessions mm -hmm. and then try to pick apart you know oh things were going smoothly and this is where it broke down mm -hmm. so we pull up those points and say okay so what can i do differently you know maybe start again at that and tweak some other parameter and see if there's a change in you know the outcome from there that's one yeah the other thing i want to say is you know like we were just talking about function at the end of the day this kid is not going to stay five years forever they are going to be six they are going to be 15 they are going to be 25 your therapy has to look to that you know and so if crayons writing is something that will come it, it's not like you know if I if if you don't do it today it will never occur that's not you know again true um, but think of things that will actually help this child through throughout life so like Ushma mentioned so many activities with things within the house we have so many functional activities within the house as well self-feeding self-bathing yes yes your clothes you know, uh, uh, pulling, uh, uh, sorting laundry, chopping vegetables, cleaning vegetables, putting things away, laying the table, putting your shoes away, everything mm -hmm. that you do in the house, you can involve a child, you know, depending on where their skill is at, right? And if they are not ready for that entire activity to be done independently, well, that's, that's your strategy. Where is the block? How can we help this person this family figure out how to get that task completed you know it doesn't have to be um uh, how should i say this like a lot of times parents compare uh you know a milestone checklist to what their child is doing and say oh five-year-old should be doing this and my child is not doing that so let's work there but you forget that you have things that have been missed at two, at one year, at, you know, six months that have now built up to this five-year-old skill. You know, it's not magic that a five-year-old can write, correct? A five-year-old at four was doing lacing of the shoe or pulling up the sock. At three was trying to eat, uh, you know, on their own using, say, a fork. Um, at two was trying to use their hands to eat. You know, so there are so many things that lead up to the skill of writing or whatever it is that, you know, happens at that age, yeah. which we don't go back and pull apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I know there are more questions coming up for specific. <laughs> I think we have to stop now. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, the last question again, it's all Pooja said. So my final thing yeah. is you have to get the big picture of the child. In which sensory system, what are the issues? And again, as I said in the beginning, sensory systems don't work in watertight compartments. They work together. Okay. And every activity that we do in life is a multi-sensory activity. So you can't just uh, work on one system at a time. I rarely work on one system. Or maybe that's a play, place to start only working on one system at a time. That's a place to start while I'm bonding with the child you know, for a few sessions, but later you have to get multi-sensory activities, multi-motor activities, uh, and in big space, not on the table. Again, writing is on the table. Remember, learning does not happen on the table. Learning happens in space. Now, that space could be your living room space, your kitchen space, your therapy room space, but learning, the park space, so the learning happens in space. This is one thing that 
you as a therapist has have to educate parents about this. I mean, I I do it every day. Every new parent, this is the thing I have to tell them that I'm not going to work with the child on the table. No, no. I will start working with them in space. You know, crawling, rolling. Uh, jumping and safe crashing, you know, climbing, things like that to get to even the writing part. Okay. I just want to also mm -hmm. say that, uh, again, like we talked about in the beginning of our session, that if you're working in pediatrics, especially, you know, um, with all these different, um, uh, what do you say, diagnoses that are, you know, getting more prevalent, uh, you know, over time, you have to get a little more um, information about how communication, how, you know, attachment, how behavior also develops within the typical yes. realm, okay? Because yes. a lot of this, yes, you are, because you're seeing this child with a diagnosis, you think these are part of that diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. But temper tantrums, every two-year-old has a temper tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. And there yeah. is aggression and there is biting. Yes, two years is, old. Yeah. Yes. Two, so two, in two, our population, it can extend to three years old. You know, there is a, a typical saying, terrible twos, you know, among all children. Yeah. Yeah. But even in the general population, terrible twos extend to threes. In my experience, even my own children had terrible threes, I would say. Why terrible twos? So right. then think about our population, which is much more delayed. They will have aggression. Now, if I were you, if I was a therapist, I would ask the parent. How many times of aggression or aggressive behavior are they having in a day or in a week? You know, I actually try to uh, have parents measure. And then with our therapy, if it comes from every day twice aggression to weekly thrice or four times, and then even reduce further down the line, then there my therapy has outcomes. Okay. All right. So <laughs> you also have to understand what you know, in terms of social and emotional behavior, what do children do? You have to understand that. All right. All right. So I think, yeah, so everybody, please, uh, you know, we will share our YouTube uh, links again on the Let's Talk Pediatric group. We've already, people have subscribed, but, you know, to the newcomers or people who haven't subscribed, not only my YouTube videos, but from time to time, I share good articles over there. So uh, please, you know, be on top of it. Okay. Thank you for attending this seminar. And uh, we will see you again sometime in the next two or three months. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye.